starting a new message series today, Speaking Worlds. My words are powerful. Amen. Let's say it together. My words are powerful. And at the end of this message, I hope you believe that. That is, that's my goal for today. My words are powerful. Hallelujah. I went and saw the Thomas babies uh, yesterday. Kellyanne had their twins in... Uh, <clears throat> She's home, not that committed to church, apparently. <clears throat> They're over a week old. I don't, I don't see what the problem is here. Bring them. They're worshipers, right? Their names are Benaiah and Sebastian, right? Nice. Not born in that order, but that's their names. They're looking beautiful. Um, so continue to keep them in prayer as they heal. Uh, so, well, Kelly, you know, she had a baby as she heals. They're fine. I don't want to drop something out there. Excuse me. Hallelujah. People are going to go up to Travis. What's, what's wrong with the babies? They're babies. What's funny about newborns is they spend all their energy trying to stay alive. And then after about a month, they wake up, right? Hmm. I have some fat storage. I think I'll start screaming, right? And then they just, <laughs> they just do that for a couple of months, right? They're just like, I think screaming will be good now. And they just wake up after about a month. They're like, all right, I'm ready to go. And uh, they have two, so it'll be in stereo. But she's a worship leader, so she'll be used to that. <clears throat> we, um, we, we planned this message series about six weeks ago, I guess. And uh, um, as I was praying into it, the Lord began to speak to me. You know, sometimes... Um, in the spirit-filled church, we can over-spiritualize preparation. We can over-spiritualize the baptism in the spirit, if that's even possible. And um, what I mean by that is we can, we can um, devalue the things that we're able to do and try to put everything on God. And actually, um, in early in my walk, there was like a value with people that I really admired. And they said, we don't even plan a service. We just let the Holy Spirit and that sounded so spiritual early in my walk until I recognized that Holy Spirit is also there in the planning, yeah. right? The Holy Spirit can also be there. And so it's, it's um, you know, the Holy Spirit can be there while you're planning your retirement. Holy Spirit can be there as you're planning your career, as your education. Don't just do whatever you want. Don't, 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 we don't want to separate our faith life and our natural life, right? Why are you at that job? Perhaps Holy Spirit is preparing you for something else with that job. Uh, and I have found um, with, with, with people who really follow the Spirit of God, the Lord uses everything in your life as preparation for your call. The Lord doesn't look at your life as two. He looks at it as one. When we give our life to Jesus, He believes it. And He then says, well, I am going to guide your whole life. And we have to learn how to track with Him even when it doesn't feel spiritual. Am I speaking to anybody right now? We got to learn to track with them uh, when, when, when it doesn't feel spiritual. And as we were planning this, this message series, I wasn't really sure why, but I knew that God had led us uh, down this, this, this trail. And uh, as I was really praying into this week, the Lord began to speak to me significantly. And he told me that, um, he said that we uh, individually and corporately are coming out of a season of trial. He, that's a good word. If anybody's been through the trial, that's a good word. <clears throat> Now, you can't be victorious without a trial. You cannot be ruled a victor unless you've been tried. You can't overcome something unless you get into battle with it, right? We can't avoid the battle and be a victor. And so sometimes when hardship comes, we can avoid it thinking that it's, um, we're, we're, you know, this is just always to be avoided, but trials are there to test us and strengthen us. And we can't always get through everything by avoiding it or rebuking it. There's some things we just have to go through. And the good thing about a trial is we, the trials come to an end. Trials are not never-ending. They're not always enduring. They actually come to an end. And the Lord told me that the season of trial, we're coming out of the season of trial. And I believe we're coming out victorious. Amen. Uh, and that trial, um, it may have been, you may have noticed that the last quarter of 2019 was hard. Some people in here was hard. Maybe the last third, maybe 2019. <laughs> maybe 2019 was the year of trial for you. And the Lord is speaking like, you're coming out. 
you're coming out of this season. And as he began to talk to me about us coming out of this season, of, I, I got to tell you what, I, I, I was happy to hear that. I was, I was, I'm like, that's all the word I needed. Like, we'll, we'll, we'll study the Bible and all that, but I'm glory to Jesus. I was done with that trial. Anybody else? I am, I am ready for that to be done. Hallelujah. I don't forsake the testing of the Lord, but I don't welcome it either. If I can just be really honest with you. I'm not signing up for it. Lord, come and test me. Test me and try me. No, no, no. Just you stay where you're at. No need to come all the way to my house, Lord. You can just declare me victorious from there. I'm like the centurion who you said had the greatest faith. No need to test me all the way over here. You could just stay there and declare me passing the trial. Anybody else in faith with me on that? <clears throat> But as I began to, as he began to talk to me about us coming out of this season of trial, he, he began to talk to me about what's old becoming new again. And I've noticed, I don't know if you noticed prophetically, those who've been around for a while, especially those who've been um, in worship, a lot of the new worship sounds sound a lot like the 90s. There's a lot of um, 90s chords progressions and a lot of 90s synth sounds coming back into worship. And I, and I believe the Lord is, is speaking to the church about what's what our old faith is becoming new again. And um, sometimes the things that we use in the beginning, we grow out of, but we discard them, and the Lord wants us to bring them back again. Amen. Yeah, different seasons, we use different things. Mm. In different seasons, we use different things. We have different emphases. Have you noticed sometimes the Lord has you read the Bible like all the time? And other times, it, it never, uh, it, you never put it away, but other times you, you find you don't read it as all-consuming, but he has you praying more or maybe witnessing more, or giving more. You go through these seasons that there's different emphasis. And in, in early in our walk, there's certain emphasis that the Lord uses, uh, and then they kind of, we kind of grow into other things. And I feel like the Lord is telling us to dust off some things we did in the beginning for this new season. And I know the Lord has confirmed that word with several people. Uh, I'm even reminded now of several conversations I've had with people who have told me that the Lord has told them to go back to original things. And, and I believe for our house, part of that includes um, fasting this year. Now, you know that's a word of the Lord because I don't like to fast. I don't enjoy fasting. I get um, in the fast. I get very little out of fasting other than, watch this, hungry. I get very hungry in fasting. Oh, and I get angry. I get hungry, and I get angry in fasting, and I'm, I'm the, the best of me. It doesn't draw out the best of me, uh, but I, I've, I've seen so much victory in fasting. I know the Lord is bringing us <clears throat> back to that, and the Lord caught me up in a vision as he was talking to me about this, and we're going to get in the Word of God. I just want to share what he has spoken to me. <clears throat> he caught me up in a vision, and he took me into a, a you know what a, a debutante's ball is? <clears throat> Have you heard of a debutante? Have you heard of it? Yeah. Well, let me explain it to you. A debutante's ball is something that they began, I believe, around the 1800s, uh, not as popular now, and it would be a coming-of-age ball for young women. And basically, women would go through a, a certain series, a time of etiquette training, uh, and then they would um, practice a routine, and the, the women, and mostly in the higher end of society, they would pick a young man, and he would be their escort for this debutante's ball, and then they would enter, much like a wedding, they would have on a gown, much like a wedding, and in this debutante's ball, they would be presented to society as a woman who's come of age, and in this coming of age, she's now available uh, for a spouse, and some single women are getting more and more excited about this word, um, but it has more to do with figurative prophetic language and symbolatry than literal, but uh, often uh, women would find their spouse at this debutante's ball as they are presented to society uh, by their fathers, and I just really felt like the Lord uh, is saying that we're, 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 he's, he's getting ready, we're having our debutante's ball, there's a coming out that's happening for us, a presentation by the Father that we've now come of age, and we're ready to be joined to that which we were called to be doing. Does that make sense to you? And the Lord is presenting us <clears throat> in this season, uh, in, and He's bringing old dreams to life again, and He's bringing, uh, He's breathing life on uh, new life on old dreams dreams. And in this season of awakening of old dreams to new, again, he's taking some of these old tools that we used in old season to bring them into this new season to bring old dreams to life in this time. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. <clears throat> um, just pay attention uh, to what God happens in the spirit. And I believe the Lord is going to begin doing it in our lives. You may find yourself praying prayers you haven't prayed in a long time. 
You might hear things coming out of your mouth that you haven't heard in a while. You may hear a, a pull by the Spirit to do things you haven't done in a long time. And I, I just feel this by the Spirit. I didn't speak this when I had this word earlier. I feel specifically the Lord is um, provoking some evangelists in this house. He's like, I just hear hearts that don't hear the cry of the lost like they once did. And I see the Lord, um, I, hear, I hear Him saying, oh, oh, ears, have ears to hear. Do you hear? Do you hear the cries of the lost? And, I, and this, the Lord is going to begin awakening, even today. Today. The heart of the evangelist for the harvest. Amen? Today. Say today. 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 <clears throat> Part of the old tools that I believe the Lord is taking out of the shed and sharpening for our house <clears throat> is um, declaring the word of God for our lives in faith. Declaring the word of the Lord in faith over our lives. In Proverbs chapter 10, verse 11, it says, The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life. Can you say amen? Now, we started the service <clears throat> saying that my words are powerful, right? And so what we're going to do today is we're going to prime the pump a little bit. We're going to help you get activated in that. So when I say amen, you're going to say amen. Amen? amen. amen. We're going to be interactive today to, 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 to kind of stir up within you faith to speak it out. Amen? amen? We're going to get involved today. Amen? We're going to allow the Holy Ghost to speak through us today. Amen? Amen? And we're believing when you walk out of here, you're going to be able to respond to the Spirit of God and speak the Word of God over your situations and see good things happen. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. I want you to get a picture in your mind right now of a fountain. Literally, I want you to look at a fountain right now. Think of a fountain. Have you seen a fountain before? Give me a characteristic of a fountain. There's water in it. There's a good one. Give me a second characteristic of a fountain. It's doing something, right? The water is doing something, right? A fountain is not water that's just there, and it says, you know what I do, so it's good. I don't need to show you. That's not a fountain, right? That's a bowl of water. And you know what happens when you turn off the fountain in a bowl of water? The film begins to grow over the top of it, and then the oxygen levels begin to drop, and mosquitoes come, and they have their larvae hatch in it, and then bugs multiply in the water, and the what once was something that gave life now is something that will make you sick. And all you need to do to bring life back is turn the fountain on. Something needs to be happening with the water on the inside of it. Amen. 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 Yes. And so we want today to be a fountain. We don't want it to go dry. We don't want to just sit there and say, I don't need to say amen. I heard that before, right? Like, no, no, no. You actually need to be speaking as much for you as for me because I need to know that you're paying attention. I have a fragile ego, right? And I need to know that I'm not speaking to myself. <clears throat> the words in our lives are like the seeds that we're planting all around us. And we need to be aware of the seeds that we're planting. For those of us who own a home, the, trying to keep healthy grass in South Florida is like, Jesus. You have to constantly be killing weeds and fertilizing what is good, or you'll either have sand or weeds in your front yard. Amen. If you're not regularly watering, and regularly uh, fertilizing, you will have sand and weeds. Do you know why? Grass doesn't grow in Florida naturally. It does not naturally happen. You have to purposefully have grass grow in your yard. So is the blessing of the Lord in your life. It does not passively grow in your life without you partaking of it. We need to be watered regularly by living water. We need the right nutrients to come in and make the good stuff grow. And we need to kill the stuff that we do not want to grow. Amen. Amen. This, we have to do this regularly. You can always tell the hood in South Florida, they got no grass. <laughs> Amen. 
You know you're in the hood in South Florida. You're like, things are good, things are good, things are good. Sand in the front yard. Here we go. And maybe a couch, right? Like, am I lying? Am I lying? I am not lying. There's no grass in the hood. (laughs) Because it takes effort to grow grass. It takes effort to get out the hood. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I'm I'm preaching from experience. It takes effort. Just do what you've always been doing. That's where you're always going to live. Right? Do you not like where you're living spiritually right now? It's going to take a little effort. It's going to take some effort. We're going to have to kill some stuff that we don't like living, and we're going to have to feed some stuff that we want to see grow. And the words of our lives are like the seeds being planted all around us, and we need to be aware of them. Now, before I go down the path, for us older saints in the room, I need to tell you, relax, right? People are like, you're not some word of faith preacher, are you? First of all, I'm not a word of doubt preacher, right? Like, I don't, I don't believe in the word of doubt, first of all, right? I do actually believe in a word of faith. Now, now, side note for us older saints, young folk, just check out and think about Twitter for a second, right? Us older folks, somewhere around, I don't know, 70s, 80s, 90s, greed got blessed in the body of Christ. And it affected every stream of the charismatic river, right? We found in the faith camp, the word of faith would bless greed, and all of a sudden, whatever I want, I can have, even if it's outside of God's will. In the, in the, in the revival river, I get to just soak all day, all night, and I don't get to worry about the lost, right? In the healing river, hey, I get to heal people all the time, and I become the superstar, and who cares if anybody actually gets saved as long as I am getting more money and being the anointed priest. Greed just got blessed in every stream. That does not mean that we're not supposed to declare the word of faith. That doesn't mean we're not supposed to lay hands on the sick. That doesn't mean we're not supposed to go out and get the lost. We're supposed to do all these things, supposed to be in the presence of God. We just need to do it with balance. Amen. We're not throwing out what is good because some people abused it. Amen. I absolutely believe that God wants to bless your life. Can't convince me otherwise. I believe God wants you to live in prosperity. Can't convince me otherwise. I also believe some people are going to suffer. I believe God wants to heal everybody. Can't convince me otherwise. Can't use the word to convince me. I also believe some people aren't going to get healed. I'm not going to tell you you're not going to be healed. That's between you and God. But I'll keep praying. I don't want to get stuck in some theology that says, because I didn't see everyone get healed, I'm going to preach that some God doesn't want to heal some people. I'm not putting things on God that he didn't put on himself. Well, I don't want to pray against his cancer because God may have given it me to make me humble. Jesus can't give you something he doesn't have, right? And Jesus does not have cancer. So, don't worry about these prayers. Like, we think like, oh, my gosh, if I pray the wrong thing, I'm going to be right outside of God's will. No, no, get your heart right. God's not going to, you know, he, he, he's not his desire that you have cancer. Amen, number one. Number two, I do not believe it's his desire that you stay in poverty. You want to give away all your money? That's between you and God. But God is not making you be in poverty. Oh, I feel like this for somebody. Hold on now. Now, if you feel like maybe you are, hmm, Oh, Jesus, pray for me for a second here. I don't know why. Um, There is a theology that, mm, pray for me, Duke. I want to get this right. Some people don't believe in prosperity. How are you going to be generous without being prosperous? Show me a Christian who's not called to be generous. Show me a Christian that's not called to be generous. We are called to be generous. Amen. Can't do that without making some money. No, I got enough money for me. Do you have enough money for others? Come on, let's get it together. Let's do what God called us to do. Well, I don't feel like I'm called to be rich. No one said you had to be rich. You can give it all away. Give it away. Hallelujah. That's a good word right there. I'll take that for us. I want to be more generous, don't you? So here is how the word of faith movement uh, and since we're talking about the word of faith, and I want to encourage you in it, I want to encourage you in it properly. Here's how the word of faith movement jumped the tracks. As I've said, I'm, I'm spirit-filled. There's a spirit-filled church. We get to correct our church. We get to correct our stream of the, of the church. We get to talk about the Pentecostals because that's who we are. Amen? Here's where the word of faith people just, here's where a fraction, a fraction 
jump the tracks, just like some of the river folks jump the tracks, just like some of the healing folks jump the tracks, right? And so here's kind of how the teaching went to jump the tracks. They said, God is spirit. And your true essence is your spirit. The true you is your spirit. And since God is spirit and you are spirit, there's a scripture that says you are God's. Therefore, since you're spirit and God is spirit, essentially you are the same as God. Now, God has this power that's floating out there and everything good is in this cloud. And the key that you unlock it is your word since you are a God and you unlock everything that you want with your words and all of a sudden, God's sovereignty is not as important. All of a sudden, your greed is okay because you are God's, and how can you have desires that are bad? So what we want to do is we want to use the word that the Lord has given us in line with God's heart, not in line with our greed. Is that, is that okay? Because I'm about to give you some tools that are going to lock some things in your life. So we want to direct them not towards frustration, but towards God's best. Amen. Amen. It's a good word right there, Carl. Thank you. I appreciate that. Listen, we cannot deny the sovereignty of God. We have to acknowledge God's sovereignty, and we do not know his perfect will at all times. However, that does not deny the power of our words. Amen. That is not, come on now, amen. amen. Come on, we're going to participatory today. We cannot deny the power of our words. Look at this. Luke chapter 6. These are the words of Jesus. The good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth what is good. Watch this. Evil man, out of the evil, brings forth what is evil. Here's the important part. For his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. Are you curious about the state of your heart today? Take an inventory of your words. Take an inventory of your words. You say, well, nobody actually knows my heart. Actually, everybody knows your heart because we've been listening to you. <laughs> everybody knows your heart because we've been listening to you. Don't mean the gossip, but I want to say, but that's all a gossip can do, right? Like you guys, like that's what you do because if it's in you, it comes out of you. Don't want to judge people, but you can't help it though because that's what's in your heart, right? And that's what's about to come out of your mouth. Out of, amen. Now listen, it's the truth right now. Come on. Now, different personalities will have to deal with this differently. You were created differently, right? If uh, you're an encourager, you're more likely to deny problems and just say things are going to be great. It's really easy for you to say positive, encouraging words. Not always as helpful in a crisis, though, right? If you're kind of a perfectionist, a little harder for you to be encouraging in tough times. Maybe it's easier for you to speak critical words all the time, right? Like maybe, maybe, let me say this, it is not a spiritual gift to point out what could go wrong in every conversation. It's not a spiritual gift to tell people to not expect good things because things could fail. It is not a spiritual gift to be able to see the glass half empty at all times or what rule you may be breaking at all times, or how things may not work out at all times. This is not a spiritual gift from God. We'll say it's of the flesh at best. Out of your mouth speaks that from which fills your heart. And we can control that. We have a little influence over our heart by really controlling the words that come out of it. Let me tell you this. There is a connection between your words and your heart. That's what I want you to see. There is a connection between your words and your heart. And you are not predestined to have certain things in your heart. You can decide to change what's in your heart. You can decide to change the words you use. And that means you're going to have to kind of think about what comes out of your mouth. As much as you want to say how things may not work out, you have to actually control your words and speak words of life. Uh, in our prophetic culture, in our house, we don't, um, <clears throat> there was a reaction, we'll say, to uh, certain schools of thought in the, in the 90s and uh, early 2000s that I just, just hated. And uh, we, don't, we don't receive prophetic words that aren't redemptive in nature. Amen. If there's not redemption, if there's not a line of redemption in your words, it's just, it's not fully cooked yet. <laughs> like that may be your natural 
this is what I'm hearing the Lord say. I'm like, all right, well, let's hear the rest of the conversation. If you're giving me words of judgment, I'm probably just not going to receive it because you've not fully heard the words of the Lord because the Lord has not cut anybody off. If they're still breathing, there's hope. Amen. So we haven't fully heard his heart. We may discern the problem, but we have not heard the Lord on the solution yet. There has to be redemptive words. And if you're just pointing out the problems, that's not prophetic. That's soulish. Anybody can see the problem. You remember how we used to uh, evangelize people by telling them how terrible they were? As if they didn't know their life was a wreck? I've come as a prophet of the Lord. You're a sinner going to hell. Good job, you. Oh, a lot of discernment there. Wow. No, the prophet of the Lord hears the good word that will set people free. That actually takes gifting and calling. Amen. Come on. No, that's a good word right there. I hope you're paying attention. This is good. Again, in Proverbs, it says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. The Bible says that life and death is in your mouth. I didn't come up with that. The Word of Faith Camp didn't come up with that. God came up with that. That's actually how we were created, that our words have power, and not just any power, life and death right there. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 12, for by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be Condemned, yes. <laughs> she wanted to redeem it, just going to turn it a little bit here. By your words, you'll be justified, and by your words, you'll be condemned. We often, listen, we are living in the world we created with our words. We are living in the world we created with our words. People who live under the most condemnation are speaking the most condemning words out there. Why do you think you're constantly feeling judged? Because your words are of judgment and you're living in the world you created with your words. Start speaking words of grace and watch what happens. You know who needs to hear your words of grace? You do. You need to hear them more than anybody. You need to hear your words of forgiveness. You need to hear your words of encouragement more than anybody else does. If you're living discouraged, guess who needs to hear words of encouragement? You do. And what we do is, as I begin to talk about this, we generally think about how the person next to us needs to hear this. But I'm talking to you. (laughs) I am talking to you and me. We're both hearing this message together. Listen, they don't need to hear it until we hear it. We don't need to be telling other people until we hear it over ourselves. We need to be declaring the word of faith over our own self. Amen. Amen. The voice you hear more than any other is yours. How about we speak life over ourselves? How about enough judgment? How about enough bitterness? How about enough condemnation? Speak words of life. They'll make you either justified or condemned. You're like, well, I don't know if that... Jesus said that. We don't believe the words of Jesus. I mean, you're at the wrong building. Like, we're followers of him, the guy who said that. And we have to believe everything he said. Amen. Do you see how powerful your words are? Do you see this? They are super powerful. And we need to focus back on this. There was, um, <clears throat> there was a story of Jesus in the Bible. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> he was telling his disciples over and over again that this religious system is going to be destroyed. Like, this is going to end. Like, this religious system that you're working within, I, I just need you to know, he's like, <clears throat> this is all ending. I know it's all you've ever known since Moses, but it's, and he's talking about the temple, and he's like, yeah, this probably isn't going to last any longer, and they're like, oh, no way, and he's like, yeah, see that tree as a symbol of the temple? It's going to die, right? And then the disciples go, and they're doing some stuff, and they, they come back, uh, they come back to this tree, this fig tree, and the fig tree was dead. I mean, it's, it's dead, and the apostles were like, Hey, Jesus, that, the, the tree, remember the tree you cursed? It's dead. And Jesus is like, um, yeah, yeah, I, I cursed it. It's dead. And he says this in Matthew chapter 11. Jesus said to them, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea and does not doubt with his heart, but believes that he says is going to happen, it will be granted him. Now, who say amen to that? 
Now, I want to say something. Has anybody in here seen a mountain move by their prayer? Yeah, no, right? There's nobody who's spoken to a mountain physically and watched it slide into the ocean. I feel like we would have a recording of that if there was. I feel like we'd be able to say a testimony of it. And uh, uh, so that's never actually happened as far as we know, as far as I know. That's never, it certainly hasn't happened to all of us. Now, all of us who get involved in the word and declare it, it's going to come to pass. However, this hasn't happened. What does that mean? Side note, any faith that tells you not to think critically about its holy text is a cult. If you say you cannot examine this word of God to figure out, hey, wait a minute, my understanding of what I'm reading here has not come to pass. And if anybody says, hey, don't, you don't ask questions. Can't ask questions about the leadership. Can't ask questions about our texts. You can't ask questions about our history. You can't, no, no, no. If, If questions look like a threat, you're in a cult. Let me tell you what, the word of God stands up to inquiry. This stands up to inquiry. Science won't disprove God because he invented science. Science is discovering what he did. It's only about a couple billion years behind. It's going to catch up at some point. So what are we talking about here? Well, we have to remember that this Bible, um, it wasn't, watch this, written in English originally to the American church. I don't know if you knew that. It was not actually written in English to the American church. And the illustrations meant something to the people Jesus was talking to, right? He doesn't talk about football in there at all, which would have made perfect sense to use football illustrations if he was talking to us. But he wasn't talking to us, right? It was written to a first century audience of Jews from a Jewish history who understood the Jewish texts. Now, this whole illustration that Jesus used, the folks who heard it would have completely understood what he was talking about. See, it, it, it alludes to the prophecy given to Zechariah. Now, you remember Zechariah uh, was, uh, was a prophet around the time that they were rebuilding Jerusalem and rebuilding the temple. You remember that Israel was conquered uh, and taken off into Babylon, right? And after a period of time, Zerubbabel wanted to rebuild some of the nations that had been destroyed, and so he was sending people off to uh, rebuild the nations, including the nation of Israel. Now, Zechariah was among the prophets who was there uh, in, in, in out to rebuild it, and, and, and they had to rebuild the wall and rebuild the temple. You remember the story, right? Now, imagine what you would have to do if somebody sent you to destroyed Boca Raton and said, I need you to build a wall around your neighborhood. Cut down trees and make a huge wall out of upright trees around your neighborhood. That would be like, that'd be difficult. That, that would not be easy, right? We don't have any power tools. Now, imagine you actually didn't have to do it around your neighborhood, but around the whole city. So a bunch of people move out here from somewhere else, and they say, hey, we're going to cut down trees. We're going to make a wall around the neighborhood and rebuild this amazing temple. That would be difficult. And so Zechariah was one of the prophets that was telling people, we have to focus on getting this God task completed. And he was getting discouraged, as I would too. I have a hard enough time just getting people to show up to my meetings on time, right? Like, let alone, why don't you work your job and feed your family? And by the way, let's build a wall around the entire city, right? So it was taking a very long time. And so the Lord was visiting Zechariah in a series of prophetic visions. And uh, he had six total before we get to the point that we're going to talk about today, which is in Zechariah chapter 4. And Zechariah chapter 4 starts with uh, the angel of the Lord visited Zechariah, and he said, and he, he woke up as a man from his sleep at the visitation of the Lord. Now, he was already the prophet of God. He had already had six visions from the Lord. He was already regarded as a prophet, but now the Lord visited him, and he woke up as if a man from his sleep. Sleep, and here's what I believe is going to happen today. I believe we may be saved already. We may already be walking with God, but something's going to happen today that you're going to wake up as if from a sleep and see things anew with a new energy and a new ability to see what God is doing, the ability to partner with God and what he wants to do. So the Bible says in Zechariah chapter 4, early on, it says that he woke up as if a man from a sleep, and then the Lord began to give him visions. Now, he had to build this wall and build the temple, and it seemed like an utterly impossible mission. Now, he may have showed up being like, man, I am going to do this thing, and it's going to be amazing, and people are going to recognize I did it, and they're going to carry me on their shoulders, and we're going to sing songs, and I'm going to be amazing. And then all of a sudden, it got hard. Has anybody done that before? You went off like it's going to be amazing, and then you're like, oh my gosh, this is hard. And it's not really working out. And that's what happened to Zechariah. And the Lord was visiting him and said, he woke up as if a man from his 
sleep. And so the angel visited him, and he showed him a picture after he woke him up. He picture, showed him a picture of lampstands. Now, you and I will know the lampstands as a menorah. You've seen it before. It's got like three branches on each side and one in the middle. You see it around Hanukkah a lot. These are the lights that Moses uh, was told to command them to put in the, in the temple to light uh, the holy place. And so we see these menorah. Now, you know, the menorah will burn out once the oil is gone or the candlesticks are burnt. But for the first time, the Lord gives him a vision of this menorah. Now, in the middle is not just a candle, but a candle with a bowl to hold the oil. Now, no longer are they limited to their own strength of the candles and what's happening. Now, there is a reservoir of anointing. Now, the oil always alludes to the presence and power of God. Now, no longer are we limited to what the candle can do, but now the anointing of the Lord is going to be there to sustain when man runs out of effort. Now, all of a sudden, the Lord is going to sustain the strength, is going to sustain the provision, is going to sustain what he wants to have happen here. And so when you see, if you ever see a menorah and you see the bowl there, that's alluding to the Zechariah chapter 4 vision of the Lord supplying what man could not do on his own, but not only did he see the bowl on the top of the menorah because the oil is what was being burned, but now there's two olive trees, one on either side of the menorah, symbolizing now that the oil that comes in that bowl is not only on its own. Now, the very olive trees, the olive, of course, it was olive oil, the olive tree that produces the oil now is constantly bearing fruit to fulfill the bowl that keeps the light burning. Now, the Lord is saying, listen, not only am I giving you more than enough, not only am I giving you a reservoir, I'm bringing you a continuous supply of the anointing and the provision and the power of God to accomplish this thing I've called you to do. That's a good word right there. Hallelujah. And so as Zechariah, come on now, as Zechariah saw this, this unlimited supply of oil for the lampstand of God, this is when the Lord speaks to him in Zechariah chapter 4, 6, you know this verse, and he says, hey, listen, not by power or by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. He's telling him, listen, y'all, you think you got to build this wall on your own. Uh Uh-uh, this is my plan. This is my plan, and I supply my oil. It's not by your power this is going to get done, Zechariah, but by my spirit we're going to come into this new thing that I've called you to that looks like an impossible task that you cannot do. You, you hear what he's doing here, right? So he's showing him, you think you got this impossible task, and I'm showing you how I will keep the lamp burning forever. It's not by your power, it's by my spirit. Then he says in Zechariah 4, 7, he says, here's how I want you to look at it. Zechariah 4, 7, put it up. He says, what are you, O great mountain? He's talking about the problem in front of you, accomplishing the will of God. You see the huge mountain? Oh, we can't get that temple built. What are you, oh, mountain? What are you, opposition? What are you? Before Zerubbabel, you will become like a plain. Completely gone. And he says, look, you're going to build the wall in the temple, and I'm bringing the top stone. You only need the top stone if the rest is going to get built. Hear me, you only need the top stone if the rest is going to be built. And the Lord said, guess what? I'm bringing the top stone. This thing is going to be done in your life. This is what he's saying. This thing is going to be done in your life. The mountain's going to be removed, and I'm bringing the top stone. This is a good word right here. And so the people he's talking to understood the reference. And so Jesus curses this fig tree. And they're like, Jesus, the fig tree, it's it's dead. Mark 11, back to this, verse 22. He's like, have faith in God. (laughs) Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says is going to happen, it shall be granted him. Can you say amen to the word of the Lord? Can you say amen to the word of the Lord? Come on. It shall be granted. Now, Jesus was speaking to some people about the temple. It was a mountain keeping the temple from being built. And he said, guess what? You see this building right here? It's going to be disassembled. They're like, there's no way that can happen. He's like, "Mm mm-hmm. This generation. In this generation, you will not see one stone upon another. And sure enough, A.D. 69, entire temple was disassembled. 
I tell you, when the Lord sets his mind to something, it's coming to pass. Amen. Amen. When he speaks a word in your life, it's coming to pass. Amen. You think Jesus was surprised that the fig tree was dead when he came upon it? You think he was like, did did my words really work? (laughs) He knew that tree was dead before it ever looked dead. He knew the moment he spoke that word, that thing was going to be dead. He knew that that thing's good. You might as well stop watering that thing because it's dead. Why is it dead? Because I said it's dead. When Jesus declares something, it's finished right there. What we get to do is agree with what he has said about the situation. Amen. We have to agree with what he has said about the situation, about our call, about our finances, about our health. Amen. I feel like this is a good word right here. I feel like this is a good word right here. Here's what he's saying. When God reveals his will to you, once he speaks his word to you, this is, let me rephrase that little thing that Jesus just said. Whosoever can have whatsoever is in God's will. Amen. Amen. Whosoever can have whatsoever is in God's will. Are there any whosoever's in here today? Come on, there's a couple whosoever's in here. I am among them. I am among them. And he gave you words so you can agree with God and see these things come to pass in your life. Look, John 7, 38. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being shall be rivers rivers of living water. That's that word in Proverbs. He's like, listen, you're not rivers right now, but if you believe in me, I'm going to turn that dark water fresh. I'm going to turn that stale water into a rushing river of life. Shakaba. This is good right here. Listen, what happened at Pentecost? What happened at Pentecost? Jesus said, listen, don't go nowhere until you get into Jerusalem and you get the Holy Ghost, right? And so they waited and they waited and they prayed. And then The Holy Ghost of God came down from heaven and fell upon them like fire. And then what happened? Gave them divine words. He didn't give them a divine book. He didn't give them a divine teaching. Didn't even give them divine understanding. He gave them holy words. He gave them tongues of angels so we could speak the perfect will of God in any situation we say I don't know what I ought to pray in this situation but the spirit of God wells up on the inside of me and I speak forth tongues as of angels declaring the perfect will of God over my situation Shakaba, I feel the Holy Ghost right now come on somebody come on somebody come on somebody come on somebody Hallelujah. I'm not embarrassed of tongues. I'm not embarrassed of the Holy Ghost. Uh -uh. Uh-uh. Hallelujah. Someone else can be embarrassed, not me. I'm using what Jesus gave me. I feel like everything he gave me is good. Hallelujah. Oh, I got to stop here. Let you go. Come on. Whoever's playing music for me, please come up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's Mr. Davis. Hallelujah. I got a drum. Yeah, come on. Come on. I feel feel the Holy Ghost right now. Someone's going to get a breakthrough right now. I just feel it right now. Do you feel this, Michael Davis? You feel this, Abby? I feel the whole. Come on, somebody. Shakaba. Shakaba. Mm. I am in that. Mm. Hold on. We, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't. We just got to get it to me in writing. It's just how we do it here. It's just our, it's just our, no, no, it's just, it's just our tradition how we do it here. Yeah, you can sit as long as you want. Absolutely. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen, listen. Stand with me if you would. Hallelujah. 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 Look at this. 1 Peter chapter 3. The one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Listen, maybe I don't have you convinced yet. Maybe I'll... Shakaba, Mike. Abby, maybe they're not convinced. Let me get some drums up here, Mr. Sound Man. Maybe they're not convinced yet. Maybe they're not convinced at the words. <clears throat> listen, listen, <clears throat> listen. Anybody in here believe in salvation? Anybody here got saved? Let's look what the Bible says about being saved. Shall we look in Romans? Let's look at Romans chapter 10, starting in verse 9. You ready? He says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, what's it say? You shall be saved. What? What? Look, look, it's so nice he had to say it twice. Let's look at verse 10. 
For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in what? What? Our words under the anointing of God have power? Shakaba, whoa. I feel something, Michael Davis. I feel something, Michael Davis. Hey, Shakaba. Come on, pray the Holy Ghost for me. I feel something happening. Woo! I feel something happening. Shakaba. Whoa, ha. Whoa, ba ba ba. Shakaba. Woo! Hallelujah. Come on, just touch the Lord right now. Come on, touch the Lord right now. Come on, just. Mm. Here's what we're going to do. Whoa. Huh. Say, my words have power. My words have power. Shake. Hold on. Come on, I got to finish to get you guys out of here. We're going to say a couple. Whoa. We're going to say a couple declarations together. I'm going to prime the pump for you. We have these listed in the. In the Woo! We have these listed in the lobby. We're just going to say a couple of them. I got it right here, but we're good. Come on. Put up the first one. We're going to say it together. You ready? Shake up. Ready? Let's say it together. I set the course of my life today with my words. You want to get one of these and take it with you. Wake up in the morning, declare it over your life. Before you go to bed, declare it over your life. You ready? Say the next one. I declare today that I cannot be defeated, discouraged, depressed. Hey! Hey! All right, number three, number three. Let's say it. Go. I am. Ha! Ready? Hey, as I speak God's promises, they come to pass. Come on. All of them. Woo! Hallelujah. I'm having a good time, Corey. Next one. Come on. Say it with boldness. God is on my side today. I cannot. Y'all stop. I got I to finish here. Y'all get me worked up. Y'all get me worked up here. Next one. Was oh, that the last one? We, oh, yeah. Ready? Let's say this one now. I have the wisdom of God today. Every situation I face. Come on. All right, let's do another one. Let's do another one. Ready? Let's declare it. I choose life today. I will not be in lack today. I will not be confused today. One more. One more. One more. You ready? You ready? Last one. You ready? Jesus. Hallelujah. You feel an encouraged church? Oh, come on, give a shout. Come on, give a shout. Come on, give a shout. Give a shout. Give a shout. I'm sorry, Corey. I'm sorry, Corey. Come on. I'm sorry. Say Kaba. Come on. Ministry team, come forward. Ministry team, come forward. Come on. Say Kaba. Oh, man. Ah! Hey! Wow. Drink deep in the river. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Corey. I'm sorry. Y'all are... I, I don't... I don't know. I'll never get to Israel. I don't know what to say. Um, 
Hallelujah. I'm feeling good. Hallelujah. So listen. On the way out, you're going to grab some of these declarations. Amen? You're going to grab some of these declarations. Amen? And you're going to read them every morning. Amen? You're going to read them at night. Amen? And tomorrow, we have our devotional starting. And we're going to go to our, you can go to our website or our Facebook page and sign up to get the devotions over the next 28 days. So we're going to start our day with devotions, with declarations, and we're going to have a good old time. It's going to be good, amen? I'm expecting some fruit to come out of this season, amen? Are you expecting some fruit to come out of this season? Yeah? Come on, let's give Jesus a shout one more time this morning. He's a very good God. We love you, Jesus. Thank you guys for joining us. Have an amazing Sunday.